calm is as strong as a spell I'll never tell Yeah, I like you, that's for sure Hi guys, welcome back to Exmo Lex. If you guys have been around my channel and content for a while, you know that I grew up in the Mormon church, left when I was 25 years old, and now consider the church to be a cult. I've done videos before discussing why, and I will leave those in the description if you want to see them. And I've consumed a lot of cult-related material since leaving the church. Countless documentaries about different cults, books, podcasts, survivor stories, expert opinions. I find it really fascinating, especially when I can see my own experience reflected in whatever cult I'm learning about. I read Combating Cult Mind Control by Stephen Hassan and got more familiar with the BITE model of authoritarian control. Um, and again, I've done videos about this. I will link those in the description if you want to learn more about this topic more broadly. I've decided I want to dive into this topic even more and discuss each point more thoroughly. I feel like not only is it interesting for past members and never members, but it also really illustrates just how controlling the church really is. And because a lot of current church members really dislike it when I use outside sources of information, I'm going to really try to stick to things that the church itself has published, shared, distributed, put on its website, etc. That way, if somebody who's questioning the church decides to give this video a watch, they're not going to be given a whole bunch of so-called anti-Mormon material, they're going to be given church material. Also, before we get started, just to be perfectly clear, not every religion is a cult, and not every cult is religious. I personally believe that the LDS church is a destructive religious cult, and I hope this series will help illustrate why. As I'm sure you can see in the title, we are going to start with this. The LDS church restricts and or controls sexuality, which is under behavior control, the B in the bite model. This one is pretty common in many cults and many religions, not just Mormonism, but it is very prominent in the Mormon church and I feel like it's worth talking about all the ways in which the church controls sexuality. At the most basic level, the church follows what is called the law of chastity which is physical intimacy only between a legally married man and woman. Strict abstinence before marriage, and after marriage, anything sexual must be between husband and wife. Not only that, but the church also believes in thought sin, citing on its website, in addition to reserving sexual intimacy for marriage, we obey the law of chastity by controlling our thoughts, words, and actions. Jesus Christ taught, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So having lustful thoughts or sexual thoughts is a sin as well. There's so much to this that it's kind of ridiculous. I feel like your average Mormon, if they were asked about if the church controls sexuality, would say something like, well, we are advised to have relations only between a married man and woman, but that's about it. No, that's not it. <laughs> This is an excerpt I found on the church's website from the teachings of the prophet Spencer W. Kimball. The early apostles and prophets mentioned numerous sins that were reprehensible to them. Many of them were sexual sins, adultery, being without natural affection, lustfulness, infidelity, incontinence, filthy communications, impurity, inordinate affection, fornication. They included all sexual relations outside marriage, petting, sex perversion, masturbation, and preoccupation with sex in one's thoughts and talking. Included are every hidden and secret sin and all unholy and impure thoughts and practices. Almost everything having to do with sex can be a sin, even if it's on accident, like thoughts. There are so many. And honestly, I do find it really interesting that Spencer W. Kimball says that preoccupation with sex in one's thoughts and talking is a sin. Because he, more than almost any other prophet or apostle, is obsessed with talking about sex. He's the one who wrote The Miracle of Forgiveness, which is just a mess of a book. He talks about sex, masturbation, and homosexuality constantly. I don't know about you guys, but it's giving projection. In the church book Gospel Principles in chapter 39, we learn more about the law of chastity. It says, we have been taught that the law of chastity encompasses more than sexual intercourse. The first presidency warned young people of other sexual sins. Before marriage, do not do anything to arouse the powerful emotions that must be expressed only in marriage. Do not participate in passionate kissing, lie on top of another person, or touch the private sacred parts of another person's body with or without clothing. Do not allow anyone to do that with you. Do not arouse those emotions in your own body. Again, almost everything to do with sex can be a sin. As 99% of you probably already know, the church also condemns homosexuality. Here is another bit taken directly from the church's website. What is the church's position on homosexuality? Is it okay to be friends with people who have homosexual feelings? The church opposes homosexual behavior and we reach out with understanding and respect to people with same gender attraction. If you know people who have a same gender attraction, follow the same principles you do in your other friendships. 
Choose your friends carefully. They will greatly influence how you think and act and even help determine the person you will become. Choose friends who share your values so you can strengthen and encourage each other in living high standards. A true friend will encourage you to be your best self. Treat everyone with kindness and respect. The church teaches that human sexuality has a purpose in Heavenly Father's plan. In order for us to be happy and fulfill that purpose, we are commanded to live the law of chastity. Homosexual behavior is contrary to that purpose and violates God's commandments. However, if someone is attracted to people of the same gender and does not act on those feelings, he or she has not sinned. The church's standard for morality is the same for everyone, no matter which gender one feels attracted to. Neither the Lord nor his church can condone any behavior that violates his laws. Again, we condemn the immoral behavior, not the person. Uh, the quiet part of this that they really dance around is you shouldn't have gay friends if they're acting on it. Because as we all know, in the Mormon church, it's okay to be gay, you just can't be gay. So it's okay to have gay friends as long as they're not gay friends. I recently did an entire video on how the church has treated people in the LGBTQIA community. If you're interested in seeing that, the link will be in the description. But for the purposes of this video, suffice it to say that yes, sexual preference is also very much restricted and controlled by the church. I also want to bring up one more older but related point. In 1982, a letter from the first presidency of the church was sent to local leaders and mission presidents. The purpose of the letter was to clarify and define the correct protocol for conducting worthiness interviews for temple recommends and prospective missionaries. And it included this interesting little tidbit. The first presidency has interpreted oral sex as constituting an unnatural, impure, or unholy practice. If a person is engaged in a practice which troubles him enough to ask about it, he should discontinue it. Predictably, a lot of people were confused and upset when their bishop told them that they were basically not following the law of chastity if they were having oral sex, even if they were a legally married man and woman. The church even received a bunch of letters from members asking why the church was getting involved with what goes on between married couples in their bedroom. So just nine short months later, <laughs> the church sent out another letter. Under the date of January 5th, 1982, we addressed a letter to you which outlined procedures to be followed in conducting worthiness interviews. Since then, we have received a number of letters from members in the church, which indicate clearly that some local leaders have been delving into private, sensitive matters beyond the scope of what is appropriate. In conducting worthiness interviews, you should follow carefully the instructions contained in our letter of January 5th, 1982. Also, you should never inquire into personal intimate matters involving marital relations between a man and his wife. You should never deviate or go beyond the specific questions contained in the Temple Recommend book. If in the course of such interviews, a member asks questions about the propriety of specific conduct, you should not pursue the matter, but should merely suggest that if the member has enough anxiety about the propriety of the conduct to ask about it, the best course of action would be to discontinue it. We feel, brethren, that if those who conduct these interviews are sensitive and wise, they can avoid such explicit questions being asked by those being interviewed. I find it hilarious that they try to act as if this was not their fault. You guys should have just stuck to the script. We gave you a script. Okay, but you also said that oral sex was unholy. So if it was brought up at all, of course the bishop would have told people that because you told the bishop that. <laughs> but the church just can't take accountability for such things. <laughs> By the way, does anyone want to take a guess at who was in the first presidency at the time these letters were written? Pause the video, then write your guess in the comments. Then come back and press play and see if you were right. If you guessed Spencer W. Kimball, the man who thinks it's wrong to be obsessed with sex, you're correct. Ding, ding, ding. He attempted to tell all the leaders in an official first presidency address that oral sex is unholy, and then it backfired and they had to rescind it. But I still find what they left of it to be really interesting. If the member has enough anxiety about the propriety of the conduct to ask about it, the best course would be to discontinue it. I don't know about you guys, but as a person who has anxiety, I um, always have anxiety. <laughs> I got anxious about stuff and I did have questions about what was and wasn't allowed, even within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. Oral, toys, positions, at some point during my early marriage, I wondered and worried about all of these things. So if I had seen this, I would have been concerned that any relations we had had to be super vanilla. Obviously the church is also super anti-corn. <laughs> I'm saying corn because I'm trying to make sure this video stays monetized. Here's a little blurb about it from the church's website. Pornography is any depiction in pictures or writing that is intended to inappropriately arouse sexual feelings. 
photography is more prevalent in today's world than ever before. It may be found in written materials, including romance novels, photographs, movies, electronic images, video games, social media posts, phone apps, erotic telephone conversations, music, or any other medium. So it's truly not just images that are considered corn o -graphic. We're even including phone conversations and romance novels. Now, if you're thinking, wow, it's awfully ironic for a church whose founder implemented polygamy and took over 30 wives, including mother-daughter pairs, underage girls, and women who were already married to other men to so heavily restrict the sexuality of its members, you'd be right. That is really ironic. But the irony would be lost on Mormons because 95% of them apparently don't have a problem with it. Since I mentioned polygamy, this is something the church stopped doing in the late 1800s, early 1900s due to pressure from the US government. But back when Joseph Smith came up with the idea, it was extremely important and again, extremely controlling. In the Mormon scripture, Doctrine and Covenants, Joseph Smith says that God reveals polygamy to him as this great thing, and that other prophets from the Bible had many wives and concubines. He says it's perfectly acceptable for him and other men to take many wives because God commanded it. He cleared it with God first, so it's all good. But it's not okay for women to take multiple husbands because that would be adultery. Even when the church allowed polygamy, it was very controlling, but obviously more so for women. Who's surprised? You might ask, well, what happens if members don't abide by all these rules? Can't they just choose not to follow? Don't Mormons have agency and free will to make these choices for themselves? Great questions, but this is really where the control part comes in. When a Mormon wants to be baptized, receive a calling, get married, go through the temple, they have to be interviewed by their bishop they have to be found worthy enough to go through the temple. One of the questions that is asked is, do you obey the law of chastity? And like we reviewed earlier, there are a lot of things that go into that. There are also questions asking if you support the prophet and if you follow all the teachings of the church, both in public and in private. In order to receive important and in the church's eyes, essential ordinances, you must be baptized and go through the temple. If you don't, you are risking your eternal salvation, which means not being in heaven with your family forever. And if you lie to get into the temple, it doesn't count. So in order to make it to the highest degree of heaven and be with your family in the afterlife, you must obey all the church's rules. This is coercion, not free will. They are not the same. So to recap, the Mormon church does not allow any sexual relations outside a heterosexual marriage, including petting, masturbation, pornography, sexual talking, sexual thoughts, sex in movies, books, video games, TV, erotic phone conversations, homosexual relations of any kind, passionate kissing, lying on top of each other, touching private parts with or without clothes, zipper sparking, soaking, if you know, you know. They also considered oral sex in a consensual heterosexual marriage to be unholy for about nine months in 1982. But they took it back because people were pressed. As I hope I've very clearly demonstrated, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints very much restricts and controls the sexuality of its members. I will be making this a series where we talk about each of the points in the bite model in depth, showing how when all of these techniques are combined, it's a recipe for mind control soup. So if you're interested in seeing more videos like this in the future, like and subscribe, and you can ring that little bell to be notified whenever I post a new video. Before we go, here's a little reminder that if you love candles, you can help support this channel by purchasing this beautiful little candle that I helped create with the Exmo Candle Co. I helped choose the name, Heathen, as well as the scent and other aspects about the candle. Buying this candle helps support this channel as well as an Exmo owned business. It smells amazing, so check it out, link in the description. Huge thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel. You guys make this possible, thank you so much. Special thank you to AA, Craig Call, Doug Davis, Mormonland, The Guiltiest Place on Earth, Jason Wilkins, Noble Monster Comics, Tans, and the Exmo Candle Company for supporting at the Demon Tier on my Patreon. I appreciate you all so much. If you would like to support the channel, there are a whole bunch of different ways you can do so in the description, as well as links to all my other social media if you want to see more content. Thank you for being here, thank you for watching. Please remember to subscribe and I will see you in the next one. Bye!